What's that? Is that better? Yes. Excellent. I've got a thumbs up from the AV guys. Okay. Just before she fires off, while Lana's talking, if any of you've got questions, put your hand up. What's happened? And one of the ushers will bring a microphone to you. That way we'll get your voice on the AV when the questions are asked, okay? Oh, there it goes. No, the screen's fine. Okay. So to get started, because you all want to see me pop the balloon, <laughs> this is your program. This is your program. This bit on the outside, this is the, this is the user interface. That bit in there, that's your code. When users are using your program, they want to get to this bit. They don't care about all this stuff on the outside. This is the stuff on the outside that they're using to get into here. The thing in here will allow them to do stuff, will allow them to achieve goals. The stuff on the outside is just the way that they achieve those goals, the way they get in there to do that. If you've got a good user interface, it helps, obviously. However, even a really brilliant user interface, I'll keep on doing this, even a really brilliant user interface is not going to be perfect. It's not going to work for someone who's got English as a second language. It's not going to work so well for someone who's never used the kind of program you've designed. Ah, I've thrown it away. It's, um, it's not, going to go, not going to make if you've got, you might have something hidden in a menu somewhere and people can't logically find that. And so what we do is we have documentation to help us to help us deal with the, um, the user interface. So between the user interface, we add the documentation, and we can get into your program. <laughs> I think that's called a technical hitch. So basically what we're doing is we're using documentation to break through the user interface to get into the core of the program so that people can achieve what they want to achieve without having to worry too much about the clicky buttons and the writing the, writing the commands in the command line. So who wants to tell me what this is? It's a black box. Very well. It's also made out of cardboard. Now is there anyone here who's never used a cardboard box before? Congratulations, Michael. <laughs> I don't think this talks for you. Um, the fact is we all, use, we all use cardboard boxes, with the exception of Michael. Uh, we all use cardboard boxes every day. Very few people actually sit down and think about where they've come from. And the, the reason this actually occurred to me at some point was because my partner started a new job. And he comes home on his first day and he says, you know what? I'm working across the road from a cardboard box factory. And I went, I never thought about where cardboard boxes come before, but someone's designed the dimensions, someone's worked out what material to make it out of, someone has worked out how many people it's going to take to be able to make this thing. They've thought about whether to package them in lots of 10 or 20 or 500. Do, I mean, do they package cardboard boxes in other cardboard boxes or do they put them in something else? Are you going to ship it on a plane? Are you going to ship it on a truck? Where are you going to send it to? Who's going to buy it? How much are you going to charge? There is a whole industry around things like cardboard boxes that we don't even think about. And the reason I bring it up is because technical writing is much the same. We've probably, if, if you're anything like me, you've probably got a drawer somewhere that's full of manuals that you've never read. Absolutely. Um, you might have opened your, you might have opened the um, the manual that you got for your fan that you bought last summer, and, and had a bit of a laugh at the bad Chinese translation or something like that. You don't read them. Nobody reads them. It. Um, the thing is, even though you've got them, you see them every day. Ah, just like a cardboard box, you don't think about who's actually written them. You don't think about where they've come from. There we go. So like the cardboard box, you don't think about where your manuals have come from. You don't think about who's written them. Like I say, you might have laughed at the translation. You probably haven't thought about where they come from. And I keep on finding myself in these situations where I'm in a conversation with somebody at a, at a party or whatever, and they say, oh, so Lana, what do you do? And I go, well, I'm a technical writer. And they go, oh, what's that then? They say, well, I, I write technical manuals. For, I write documentation for, for technical products. Oh, I guess someone has to write them, huh? It's, it's the cardboard box problem. Nobody thinks about where they come from. So what I would like to do here, I'll 
the, the fact that it's black also is important. Um, engineers quite often view technical writing as a black box. What happens is they give us source information and we pop books out. And there is, actually a, there is actually a process that happens, except for the hecklers down the front. There, there is actually a process that happens in there. And what I would like to do for you today is quite literally unpack the black box. So what I'm going to do is uh, discuss the process that we use at Red Hat. I'm, I'm a Red Hat technical writer, by the way. Uh, well, I'm going to discuss the process we use at Red Hat. We use a, fa a basic five-phase waterfall model. Quite simple. I'm going to try and spend about five minutes on each of the phases talking about what we do in each phase and what tools we use at each stage of it. And then because I need to live up to my, uh, to my abstract, I, uh, I will go through and do some, do some uh, writing tips for you at the end. So, phase one. Phase one is what we call the information plan. And that's where we work out our dates, essentially. So this is my diary. When we, when we get to an information plan, we work out not so much title and that kind of thing, but more what the book's going to cover, who the audience is going to be. We do our audience analysis. That's really important. And we work out who the date's going to be, who our, where we're going to get our information from, at least in a rough context, and who our managers are going, going to be in this particular situation, what project we're working on. The tools that we use are primarily a wiki at this point, and that's because it's easy to edit, it's easy to share, it's easy to organize stuff into a hierarchical kind of system. We've got about 50 writers at Red Hat. It's important that we can keep things organized, that our managers can find our projects and our information plans and check out what we're doing, that our engineers can, can go to our wiki and, and find the information plan that's relevant to their product. Uh, and I'm going to try and knock this microphone off again as I fish something out of the pocket. It's gone. No, I've lost it. No, it's here. It's all right. We also use a ticketing system. I'm sure you've all got one of these at the moment. We also use ticketing system. We, we open a just an overarching ticket to start with, and this is essentially a management function. It's a way of our managers being able to say, OK, so what's Lana working on at the moment? When is she due to finish it? Will she be on time? Uh, how many other, you know, is she struggling? Does she need more resources? Um, that would be nice. And, um, you know, and who, who my engineering manager is so they can get in contact. So that, that's basically a management function at, at that point. So we can get rid of those now. Phase two. Phase two is where we decide what goes in the thing. In this case, it's lollies, which is a lot more fun than most of my documentation. We work out what it's going to look like. We work out what's going to be called. We do our title, our subtitle, a bit of an abstract, whatever. And we work out where we're going to get the information to create the thing. We, um, we usually identify a subject matter expert in phase one. And then in phase two, we get in contact with them. And in, in most cases, you've got your subject matter expert. It's an engineer on the project, a senior engineer on the project. You can go, hey, Bob, give me some information. He'll go, yeah, sure, I've been working on this wiki. I've got some bugs here you can look at. Um, I've been blogging about it. There's usually a fair few things that we can get in there, and we can aggregate that all together. In addition, um, believe it or not, we do Google for information. We, I have been known to look up Wikipedia to check technical aspects. Um, there's code comments, of course. And let this be a lesson to you engineers. If you're writing code, you must comment correctly, because one day a technical writer will be reading it and trying to work out what you're doing. Um, code comments are very, very important. Um, there's also things like knowledge base. If we've had uh, support staff writing knowledge base, we've had customers giving us information, bug histories, that kind of thing. Uh, tools, in this case, we're back to the wiki, believe it or not. And um, it, it's just a really good way to be able to gather all the information. Because we're getting information from such a disparate range of things, we gather all the information together on a wiki. I just draw up a quick table with table and section and chapter headings and the link to the, where the information is coming from for that chapter. Would you like to pass them around? Take one, pass it around. <laughs> no, take one. Take a lolly and pass it around. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't quite specific enough. <laughs> um, the other... I missed that comment. The, the other tool that's really important, in addition to our wiki, is our bug system. 
bug because he's big. He's our tracker bug. So what we do is we, we set our tracker bug up at the top, and this is where the management function happens. So the management, management can look, engineering managers at this point will you look at it and see all the other bugs, all the other bugs that are sitting underneath it like, quite neatly like this, and they can, they can approve it. They can say, yep, that's fine, they're the ones we want. And then we work, obviously work on the individual, on the individual bugs. It is, actually. Uh, RT3. Fairly, fairly standard in, in many organisations, I think. Um, we use several wikis in Red Hat. The one that we use specifically is TrackWiki. Um, there, there are several in play. There's, there's constant arguing over which one's the best, which one we should all use, which one should, which one should go company-wide. I, I don't know if they'll ever come to a conclusion, but TrackWiki is what we're using at the moment in our department. Uh, would you like to just take the microphone? Oh, sorry. Sorry, the question, the question there was, uh, which wiki do you use? And the answer was TrackWiki. Is there something? Um. Track is a, a bug tracking system. So, it is and, also. So is we, it, do you make no, we only use the wiki component of it. We don't. We don't use the bug. We use Bugzilla for the for the bug tracking, of course. Uh, so moving right along, phase three. Phase three, of course, is the most important part, and this is where I get to do my writing. This takes up fifty percent of the project, which is why it's the most important part. Or, it's the most important part. That's why it takes up fifty percent of the project. Put it that way. So what I do at this point is I take the table that I created in the last phase. If you remember, I created the table with the section and chapter headings with the links to the information. I write down my section and chapter headings in XML, not on paper, unfortunately. <laughs> we, we do a table and section headings, and then we, then we start dragging the information in. We edit it and make sure we're happy with it. We go over it and over and over it, and eventually we get to a point where we individually are happy. And that's where the fun begins. So after that, we do reviews. We make sure it's correct. Obviously, we all have our own dictionaries, but we also have, use other people's dictionaries. We do have a technical editor on site who likes to look at our stuff occasionally. We have a legal department who we like to check out with trademark kind of issues. And of course, the most important part is the technical review. If it's not technically accurate, it will not get published, at least in theory. <laughs> I, um, and if you do find a bug in any book, please raise. <laughs> if you do find a problem in any book, please raise a bug. And we'll fix it. Um, the technical review is the most important. We send it back to our subject matter experts, and we do also like to um, send it to in the entire engineering team that we're working with. And so we just basically say, is this technically accurate? They will raise bugs. They will email us. They will give us all sorts of feedback, and we then obviously coordinate all that. And that's where our bug system comes in as well. Oh, more bugs. So we, they will raise bugs. We go through each individual bug. We fix it. We get rid of it. And after that's happened, after we've fixed each bug, we've gone, yep, that's done. We send it over to quality engineering. And quality engineering go, you know what? That one over there, she tried to fix it. And they'll send it back. And we'll have to fix it again. And then we can get rid of it. <laughs> so um, that, ah, the tools. The tools start getting interesting in this phase as well. Um, when I started with Red Hat, which was nearly four years ago now, thank you very much. It's nearly four years ago when I start, started with Red Hat, and um, back then we had a system that we used to call DocBot. It was pretty obvious, DocBot. Um, it was a robot that created documentation for us. And what, at the time we were using CVS as um, our uh, repository. It would grab the stuff out of CVS, it would wrap it all up and package it. And we then had an internal website where we could go and get our HTML and PDF versions. Over time, we decided to formalize things. We've got a fantastic engineer in our engineering content services department by the name of Jeff Fern, who some of you may have heard of. And he, create, he recreated DocBot and relabeled it as Publican. I've got a bit of an issue with the name Publican, because to me, a Publican is someone who owns a bar. But anyway, Publican, publication, that's where it came from. And so Publican now hooks into uh, not CVS anymore, it's SVN, moving with the times. Eventually, eventually, we'll, get, eventually we'll get to Git. But, 
Uh, it gra grabs our stuff out of SVN, it wraps it up, and we have now a proper official staging process. So we've got an internal stage where we can put up our draft versions and our engineers can look at it directly on the, on the stage. And public can also do the publication for us, but I'll get to that in the next bit. I'm not going to throw that because I'm going to have that later. So phase five. Phase 5 is a bit interesting because Phase 5 is mostly about translation, but it's also about publication, which are two completely different things, and I have no idea why they've been lumped into the same phase, and you should all go and speak to Joanne Haykos, who wrote them, and find out, because I'd like to know. So translation. First of, first of all, um, Red Hat translates into around about 26 languages. It does vary. Um, anywhere in the 20s as a general rule. It, obviously not every product goes into every language. I do believe RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, goes into most of those languages, if not all. Someone from Red Hat in the audience may be able to confirm or deny. Um, it really depends on where we're marketing each product as to where, where, which translations it gets. And it also depends, of course, on what translators we have available. Most of our translators are in Brisbane. I believe we've got around 30 of them. At the moment, possibly. I'm looking at Marco because Marco might be able. It's around that number, isn't it? Um, they all work very, very hard and they're all lovely people. And what Publican does, so coming back to Publican, just because I like holding beer and waving it around, I keep on thinking I'm going to pop the lid on that soon if, it was only, if only it was cold. <laughs> I'd. Um, when, what Publican does is we've, we've got a sort of magic button in Publican that basically splits everything up into the individual language files. Each translator then gets their individual language. They do the translation for us, which to me is a black box. The whole translation process is a bit bizarre. They go through and they, they do their translation. They then push, we push it all back into Publican, and Publican wraps it up on our stage so that you can just select which language you want. You get your book in that language. It's really, really neat. Um, Publican also, oh, I'll move, into, I'll move into publication. Let's move away from translation. Sorry, French. Um, we, we publish. We don't publish dead tree books anymore. Obviously, this book was actually, I purchased this in 1994. It's still got the receipt in it. I clearly haven't read it because <laughs> I went and worked for an open source company. Um, we don't publish dead tree books. We do have the ability to publish dead tree books. We, we can provide files to printers if we wanted to. We generally don't. Um, and because I'm too cheap, because I didn't read this book, because I'm too cheap, I, I printed one out. We, uh, we publish in HTML, standard HTML, where every chapter's on a second page. You click next to go to the next chapter. We publish on single page HTML, which is fantastic if you're searching for something. It all goes on a single page, you've got to scroll a lot. We publish in PDF, of course, and we also publish in EPUB, which is a fairly new thing that we've only just started doing reasonably recently. And it's actually really exciting. How am I going for time? Can I throw a story in? I'm not doing too badly. Excellent. I'll throw in a quick story and hopefully it won't cut into the question time at the end. Um, there's an interesting story that was taught. I mentioned Joanne Haykos before, who's the woman who wrote the, wrote the model that we use. Joanne Haykos was, uh, is an American writer, documenter type person, and she, um, she told this, this story once of there were, there were guys who, the guys who work up the, the energy, the electrical poles, and someone had been, a company had been hired to go in and rewrite their documentation for them. They had, they had a reference manual that they, they needed to use to look up various codes, whatever it is that these electricians do. And, and then they, you know, they need to look it up while they were working. So they did a great job. They redesigned everything. They got it all written down and they produced this manual. And they presented it to the company. And the company presented it to their workers. These are the guys who work up poles, I'll remind you. And they went, how am I going to use this? I can't put it in my back pocket. I can't hold on to it because I'm busy holding on to the pole and whatever tools I've got and all the rest. How am I going to work it? And so it got ignored. Basically, they hadn't done an audience analysis. They hadn't worked out who it was that was going to be using these things and what conditions they were going to be using it in. And this is why we began, they did eventually do an EPUB version to, to solve that, that issue. Uh, I believe another company came in and fixed it. But um, this is exactly why we began using EPUB. And there's an individual story in Red Hat about it. Um, our global professional services people quite often work in, um, 
in, they work on site at various customer locations, and they're quite often subject to, to fairly rigid uh, security protocols that the, the customers they go to, especially if they're talking government or defence or whatever. And of course, they can't they can't take a printed version of the rel. If anyone has seen the rel deployment guide, it's like hundreds of pages long. It's really huge. It's this mammoth book that everyone at Red Hat talks in awe of, the rel deployment guide. Um, so they can't go take a printed version because it's just impractical. They can't use internet when they're on, on site. So they can't access the online versions. What do they do? What do they do? They download the EPUB version, take it in on a non-internet connected machine. They've still got the information at their hands. They don't have an internet connection and they don't have to carry a set of encyclopedias. That is exactly why we started doing this. So there's my... Lucky it's not a real Kindle, huh? Okay. So that pretty much wraps up phase four, which means we've only got one phase left. In theory, this should be the phase where you get the money. I've got doubloons. You know what, though? I bought this from the $2 shop. And you know what they say on them? Kids obviously don't understand what doubloons anymore. It says pirate money. This should be where you get the money. It's not. We work for open source. <laughs> don't get money in open source. What are you talking about? So phase, phase five is actually where we do our review. So what we do, because we're geographically disparate, um, as a to give you an example, currently my engineering team is based in both Raleigh and North Carolina and Westford, which is right near Boston. My project manager is in Bano in the Czech Republic. My documentation manager is in Brisbane. I live in Canberra, which is another hour out during summer. Um, I've got a developer in the UK. I think we've got another one in Canada. Yes. I think we've got another one in Canada. Oh yes, and we've got a couple in South America as well. So the fact is, it's very, very difficult for us to get in a room together and say, so, how was it? It's not going to happen. In fact, it's, it can be very, very difficult for us to even find a time for a meeting, even if we can all get on the phone at the same time. However, normally what happens is the person who's in Australia gets up at 2 a.m. and we jump on the phone. Do you like my new iPhone? I was very pleased. It makes sounds, but they're very soft. <laughs> it wouldn't be very good in a train station or something. Anyway, so what we do is we get on the, we get on the phone, we have a call, and we say, so, was it good for you? Yeah, it was great. Let's do it the same way next time. Or, you actually, no, that really sucked. Let's try something different. Yeah. So, <laughs> I promised you some, I, I, did, I did promise you some, uh, some tips on writing. The fact is, anyone can write. Um, I know you probably have grown up all your life going, oh, I hate writing, this is why tech writers exist, because I don't want to do it. Uh, somebody else has to do the writing. Unfortunately, you do have to do writing, even as an engineer. Um, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it, you do have to do writing. At the very least, you have to comment your code, because otherwise technical writers will come and stab you. <laughs> You, uh, you probably, thank you. You do, you do have, to, have to document what you're doing at the very least. We like you to do things like write blog posts and write wikis and, or it'll keep some scrap paper on your desk and just note down what you're doing. It's, it's very, very helpful. So even as an engineer, yes, you do have to write. The good, the good news is, of course, I, I don't believe that anyone actually sucks at writing. I, I do believe you can, be, you can learn to write. It is a learned skill. It's not an inherent skill. I wasn't born with a dictionary in my mouth. I'm not particularly special in this regard. I've just worked at it. So, slides do suck. Yes, I think I've got six, so I'm sorry. I, I sort of had trouble coming up with props for these ones. So, um, the first thing you have to do, and I have already touched on this, is get organised. And this is where your phase one information planning comes in. If you know when you've got your due date, when you've got to be finished by, and not just when you've got a, your final due date, your final delivery, but when you've got to get the next bit, and the bit after that, and the bit after that, you will be able to achieve it. And to illustrate the point, how long do you think it takes to write a novel, a standard, you know, fiction novel? Mills have been three weeks. I, I could go along with that. Um, a year? Let's talk about literary fiction, decent fiction. A year? Two years? Five years? A lifetime? <laughs> you knew where I was going with that. <laughs> um, it, 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 you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people with unfinished novels in their bottom drawer. I, uh, at, at, without boasting, I've written three. 
and I wrote each of them in 30 days in November, as, as Noreen pointed out. Um, and the way that works, it's a competition called National Novel Writing Month, and I'm not going to advertise it here, but if you want to know more, come and to speak to me. Uh, it's a competition called National Novel Writing Month, and the goal is to write a 50,000 word novel in 30 days. No, none of my three novels will ever be published, they all suck. <laughs> So don't even bother asking me. Um, they, but the fact is, I have written three 50,000-word novels. Yes, they are complete novels. They're complete stories. They had a, a beginning and an ending and a, and a middle in most cases. And, <laughs> and they were all written within 30 days. Some of them were, written, were, were finished at a quarter to midnight on the last day, but they were all written in 30 days. And that's because you have a goal. If you have a goal, you've got something to achieve. It's the way we work as humans, and I'm sure we've all heard, we've all been to goal-setting courses and this kind of thing that, that work makes us do all the time. And it's always about breaking it down into achievable chunks. And it's always about setting deadlines. It's always about making them, making them uh, you know, realistic and timely and all the rest of it. And that's exactly what you need to do in your writing documentation as well, is, is stick to your standard goal setting principles, make sure you've got a date, make sure you know what you're supposed to be delivering by that date, and ideally have a manager making sure you're doing it. So the next one is choosing your voice. The way I'm speaking to you now is completely differently, is completely different to the way I would be addressing these children. I mean, other than the fact that I, I probably would have had a DeLorean to do it. Uh, I love this picture. They all look so neat and proper. I'm sure my daughter doesn't look like that in school. Um, but the, the point is the voice is different. We use different words. We use different expressions. We um, I was going to say, if you're addressing school children, you might use more props, but maybe not. Um, we, the, the, the point is, we, we, we dress things differently. It's exactly the same in writing as in speaking. You, you, you need to talk to your audience in different ways. Um, it might come as news to many of you, but engineers are not the same as sysadmins. Sysadmins, and Jo made the point in her talk on Monday, sysadmins are different to engineers and they need to, be, they need to be spoken to in a different way. Not that one's more intelligent than the other, of course. They're just different. So when, you, when you're addressing a sysadmin, you need to discuss different aspects and different ways of achieving goals than when you're, when you're t talking to engineers. And it's, it's different, again, when you're talking to users or when you're talking to contributors, uh, there's, or when you're talking to management or whatever. So choose your, make sure you've, you know your audience and you choose your voice. Say what you mean. If you want to warn people that there are flying toasters, and I'm going to have to read this out because I always forget it, say warning flying toasters, for starters, don't say, take heed of the fact that in some cases there may be airborne heated bread cooking apparatus. Because what's going to happen is by the time they've finished reading the sentence, they're going to be hit in the head. <laughs> don't ever say more than you need to. Analyse every word, analyse every sentence, analyse every paragraph, make sure it's serving a role. Um, some of my favourites in technical writing of things that there may be a risk that, there is a possibility that, in some cases this may happen. Don't, just say sometimes. There's, there are ways of rephrasing things. Phrase it the way you would when you're speaking, not the way you would when you're trying to write technically. Um, this brings me very neatly to use short sentences. There are rules of thumb about writing short sentences, um, about how long sentences should be. As a general rule in technical writing, you want to be around about 15 to 20 words. That's fine if you're reading the dead tree books. If you're not reading dead tree books, if you read it on a screen, um, attention spans are different. Uh, we're, we're much more distracted when we're on a screen because, you know, there's like Google and stuff there and it's much more exciting than reading this technical manual. Uh, you need to try and keep it sort of 10 to 15. That's on average. Of course, don't be afraid if you get a 16-word sentence. It's not the end of the world. You want some shorter ones and you want some long ones. What you don't want is 17 sentences that are all four words long, followed by 17 sentences that are all 34 words long. Because for starters, it's going to look really weird, it's going to sound really bad, and your user's not going to understand what the hell you're talking about. Um, one of my favourites. Who here went to uni? Most of us if not all. Okay, when we're at uni, we're taught to write up to a word limit. So you might have a fantastic idea, it's the great idea, it's the best idea you've ever come up with and you can probably express it very neatly in about 300 words. At university, you're expected to express that 300 word idea in a 5,000 word essay. 
And so we do. We do. We, we, we sit down, we start, we, we write a very flowery introduction, and then we write the next bit, then we write, and we choose the longest words we possibly can because you know what we want to do? We want to teach our lecturers how clever we are. You've, I've just described every essay I ever wrote. <laughs> Except for my last one, because I've started an actual technical communicators course, and it's really hard not to write like a uni student. Um, you actually got to write like a technical writer in a technical writing course, and there, there's all this cognitive dissonance with that. Um, unfortunately, tech writers don't get paid by the word. It would be nice if we did, because I can be very loquacious. <laughs> um, I. Um, what was I saying? I was, going to, I was going to talk about academic writing in terms of not just how long and flowery the language is, but also the words we choose. We choose these big words because it makes us look smart. And as humans, we want people to think we're smart. We want people to read the book and go, oh, haven't they got a fantastic grasp of the English language? I'd really like to read a literary novel written by this person. And I didn't bring it with me. I do have a 91-word sentence that I have on cards that I like to give out but, and then ask people what it actually means. But uh, I, I didn't bring it with me, unfortunately. Um, I, I, to, to illustrate this a little bit more, I, I did some editing for a gentleman who shall remain nameless, so that he remains shameless, I guess. Um, he, uh, it, it was absolutely abysmal, and it was a typical case of university writing, a typical case of uh, the, the real pretentious language. And I've got some examples from this particular essay. Um, I, I, I was going to say that the, the problem too is when, when you're using big fancy words that you might not speak, you might not use in conversation, you quite often misspell them. And you, they quite often mean something you don't, maybe didn't realise that they mean. Um, one, of the, one of the ones he used a lot, he used the word enumerated, but what he really meant was discovered or found. The word enumerated means you counted something doesn't mean you found it. And so what he'd do is he'd say, we, we logged onto the server and we enumerated the packages. And I can bet he didn't sit there and go, well, that's one package, that's two packages, and that's three packages. He looked at the packages. He might have looked at what sort of packages they were, which ones, what categories they fell into, whatever. I can bet your bottom dollar, bet your bottom dollar he did not count them. So in with this, he did not enumerate them. He found them. Um, utilizing. Utilising gets used again and again and again and again and again. It's not incorrect. I will say that. It is not incorrect. It's just long. And it doesn't need to be. Using is fine. We're all, we're all modern, you know. We don't need to, see, need to use this archaic language anymore. Um, the other one he did a lot was provide, when what he really meant was prove. And I can tell you right now that nothing will ever provide to be true. <laughs> And the other one, which I've actually forgotten to write down here, but I can't forget it, is the word assess. The word assess has four S's in it. It's A double S, E double S. If you don't put the last S on, it's not assess anymore. It did make for interesting and very hilarious reading in some cases. Oh, I do have a prop for this one. This is my favourite prop. Arr. Arr. It goes with my doubloon. Sorry, my pirate money. It goes with my pirate money. Oh, it's in the box because I didn't get it. Arr. Okay, edit with a knife. <laughs> I'm going to have to pick all this stuff up, aren't I? Edit with a knife. Every editing pass you do on your document should make your document about 20% shorter. I'm not kidding. That's true. If you do five passes, well, okay. <laughs> it should get about 20% shorter. It's because you're cutting out the extra words. Oh, no! <laughs> I, broke my, I broke my side. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Last time I go shopping at that $2 shop. I'll have my doubloons instead. Okay. Um, you should be getting 20% shorter. You're cutting out extra words. You're cutting out anything that is not absolutely essential. Um, a, lot of a lot of people would like to do this thing where they use the word namely. They explain something, and then they tell you that they're going to explain it. Why not just, just say it? 
Just don't, don't, don't. Uh, what's, the, what's the example I like to use? Uh, I, I did a Hawaiian dance, namely the hula. Don't need to. You don't need to. You say, I did, a, I did a Hawaiian dance called the hula. Or I did the hula, which is a Hawaiian dance. You don't need to tell me that you're going to tell me something. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Every, every time you edit, bring it down. Take out all these extra things. If you've got a sentence that says more than one thing, put it into two sentences. Cut out those extra filler words. Um, last one. You need to read what you write. It's not easy to do. It's not as easy as it sounds. Because the problem is we read what we think we've written. It's hard. It's, it's hard to read what you've actually written and not what you think you've written. The best way to do it, there are three tactics that I use. The first one is walk away. Walk away for as long as you possibly can and then tell your boss that the reason it's delivered late is because you had to walk away from it because Lana said so. <laughs> I tried that, it didn't work. <laughs> Um, walk away from it, even if it's only to go out and get a coffee. And you know, obviously the longer you can leave it, the better. Leave it overnight is always a good idea. Um, but even if you just get up and have a walk around and then come back to it, at least you, you're looking with slightly fresh eyes. Secondly, do the first... Here, yeah, sorry. <laughs> do the first pass forwards, but do it out loud. I, I, I work from home, which is a good thing for my co-workers. And uh, I have a big picture of the Beatles on my, on my wall. So John, George, Paul and Ringo get most of my, my books read out to them. They have very, very boring lives these days. So <laughs> you, you stand up and you read it out loud. And the reason you read it out loud is because we naturally use language and we naturally use grammatical constructs. And that was a big word. <laughs> when when you, you do that slight little pause, you put, you put a comma in. You do the bigger pause, you take a breath, put a full stop in. If you find you're reading sentences out and you're getting short of breath, you probably need to put another full stop in there right now before you have to go <gasps> and pass out. Because John Lennon always looks at me really badly when I do that. <laughs> um, then once you've gone through forwards and you've read out loud and you've had a good drink of water because you generally need one, uh, then read it backwards. Which sounds silly. Uh, depending on the length of your document, if you've got a short document and you're doing something like proofreading your business cards, read each word backwards. Because then you see the word and not its placement in the sentence or its placement in the paragraph. If you've got a longer document, read each sentence. Read the last sentence first and then the second last sentence and the third last sentence and walk the entire way through your book. And that way, hopefully, you'll break the... You'll, you'll get that memory, you'll break that memory pattern that you had. If you know when you wrote it that this is how it was supposed to sound, if you read it backwards, it's not going to sound like that anymore and it's going to actually trigger those, those typos. You're going to find the double ups, the VVs, uh, when they break over the line and that kind of stuff. So read it backwards. Um, oh, I have another story. Do I have time? <laughs> Eight minutes, go, excellent. I, I'm sure I've told this story before, so please stop me if you've heard it. Uh, in Canberra, about 10 years ago, in the Yellow Pages, there was an ad for a bus company that advertised quite proudly that they did school executions. <laughs> if they had have read the ad backwards, I can guarantee they would have worked out that what they really meant was excursions. I love that story. Anyway. Um, Sorry to do this to you. I have also been asked to mention that Red Hat are hiring. I've got flyers down here. They are looking for engineering types. They're looking for support service types. They're looking for security types. They're also looking for technical writers and translators. So please come down and get a flyer. It gives you information on who to contact to get more. Um, you can also grab a business card off me and I can help you do that, which is really good because we have a hiring bonus. OK. <laughs> I think I'm done. Do we, do we have questions? Or? Is there any questions? This gentleman here. Yeah.